Hello students, Eric Magidson here. So let's talk about chapter three, computers and mobile devices. Now I'm gonna break this lecture up to multiple videos so that you can consume them in, in small bite-sized pieces as you will. So let's just take a look here as we go through the material. These are the objectives and outcomes. We'll cover all this stuff, so no worries. You can pause and review those. Here's the additional outcomes. So again, we're going to break this up into multiple pieces. So types of computers, this is sort of redundant from what we've already talked about, but laptops, tablets, desktops, terminals, servers. Let me just take you in and we'll take a look. So love using my favorite tool. Google went out to Google Images. Okay, so a traditional type of computer, the typical laptop. Most people buy more laptops than desktops today. Why? Because they're highly portable. Also, don't forget, there's a sub-lecture called Comparing Computers that you're going to want to watch. Um, it's available in both Chapter 1 and Chapter 3, so check that out. It goes into more detail as to the components that are inside these devices. But, you know, here's a typical laptop. This is a 2-in-1, 2-in-1, meaning it can be used as a laptop or a tablet. So a 2-in-1 here, you know, the HP, etc. Okay? Now, servers, as we've discussed in class, servers are larger, more powerful computers. Uh, we tend to throw these into data centers, whether that be one or two servers in my small business or thousands of servers out at the Facebook data center. So this is what it would look like. And these servers might serve one or many purposes inside an organization. So at Facebook, we might have servers that handle just your instant messaging, your wall, storing of photos, analyzing of photos, sharing of photos, you get the idea. So these are servers. So notice that there's tower servers just like desktops that you're used to, okay? And then there's rack servers here. So these go in a rack and then there's blade servers. And what a blade server is, is it's a large rack mounted unit that can hold many servers. So let me just click on this, there we go. Each one of these is a server in itself, so you get the idea of what those are. And I'll give you more details on servers as well. So when we get into other computing devices, remember a computer today is pretty much anything that processes data, processes, it may store data, whatever the case may be. So the control units in your car, for example, if you have a pretty modern car, it's going to be computerized. It's going to have many computers in it that operate. So uh, ebook readers, for example, digital cameras, smartphones, as we discussed in the lecture, our smartphone today is pretty much anything. Uh, you know, it can be a reader, now not like the traditional reader, you know, with the electronic paper, which makes it easier to read in the sun, dedicated to hold ebooks, etc. But if we can get away with the screen, wonderful, we can use the screen and do our thing. Uh, game devices. So when we talk about game devices, we can think of the old uh, you know, Game Boy single unit handheld devices, still popular. You know, here's another one. If, if we go down, we'll finally get to, oh man, Super Nintendo. This is bringing back. Uh, all the way down to modern gaming machines like the Xbox One here. Also, these our computers tend to be multi-unit, which means we can do things like play movies on them, surf the web on them, stream music on them, because they have applications built into them uh, to do all that stuff in addition to gaming. Now, when we get to embedded computers, this was a little harder to find, but you know, here's the idea of, here's some glasses that have a embedded computing device. There's probably a little micro monitor in there. You can think of Google Glasses. Um, embedded computers tend to be computers that are used for specific purposes. So something just to keep in mind. Now, as we go through, so mobile computer, portable, makes sense. You know, user can easily carry it from place to place. <laughs> what constitutes a mobile computer today? Really, whatever the user is willing to carry. Um, but most of us will go with a small form factor, a 13-inch screen. I tend to carry a 15-inch screen because I need more real estate. Personal computer, mobile computer, we've pretty much discussed that. 
You know, so even that Fitbit on your wrist, that smartwatch, whatever, that is a computer. Your navigation system in the car, a computer. My system in my Toyota is the navigation. It connects to my phone for Bluetooth. It connects to my phone for actually making phone calls. It'll announce texts, you name it. So laptop, tablet, all in one, servers, smartphone, ebook reader, and then embedded computers or you know personal assistants, whatever you want to call them. Laptops we've gone through. A lot of us today are going with the ultra thin. Again, highly portable. We're going to get more space. Thus, we're probably going to get more power, more features and functionality. The bigger the laptop is, we might even still get an optical drive here. Whereas in the ultra thins, if we want an optical drive, it becomes a peripheral device. So here with a, you could call this a two-in-one, you could also call it a tablet. Sort of the difference is, you know, with the Surface, it is a full-blown computer. It tends to have some ports here. We get the magnetic keyboard that connects. It can, it's a two-in-one. It can be used as a tablet independently or as a quote-unquote laptop. Same thing here, convertible tablet, now called a two-in-one. Turn it around, use it as a tablet. Now, handheld computers, here's one you might not have thought about. So a scanner where we go around a st store, we can take inventory, we can enter. The data tends to be stored either in here. A lot of these modern devices are wireless, which means as we scan the data, it's going into the database in real time. But a lot of times what it'll do is it'll store it locally. We go back, we stick this in a cradle, and it transfers the data. Desktops or desktop computers, again, tend to be more affordable because the components don't have to be manufactured as small, um, although prices are getting very close because you as consumers are consuming more laptops. And as we know, supply and demand, um, quantity of manufacturing, we can get the price down when we're manufacturing hundreds of thousands of parts over just thousands of parts. But they tend to, you know, they tend to come with larger monitors, whether it's an all-in-one or a traditional desktop where we, you know, where we have the tower and we have a separate monitor, etc. But again, especially for gamers, they'll get these because they can put in dual video cards. They can also have expansion slots so that they can add specific components that they want inside their gaming experience or inside a desktop for that matter. Um, people that do a lot of audio would put in a audio card, uh, a high-end audio card so that they could do 7-1 surround sound, for example. So uh, servers we've talked about, <laughs> gave you an example of a rack server, a blade server, a tower server. And you know, just knowing the difference, a tower server looks like a desktop. I don't like their picture here of a blade server because it kind of looks like a rack server. I think the example I gave you uh, where there's a storage unit where many servers go vertically into the rack is a much better example of what we tend to see with a rack server. The cool thing with a rack server is it all being one unit, they can all work together to process data, etc. So I highly suggest that you pause this slide and review it, read through it. You know, servers can serve many purposes application server, which means it's serving an application. For example, it might be serving an antivirus application out to hundreds or thousands of computers inside a local area network. Commonly, a backup server, which has the backup software. It's backing up other servers. It's backing up itself. The data may be stored on that server or on a storage device or today, even in the cloud. And we'll talk about backups more. It's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of cloud backup. So many companies are selling the set it and forget it. But let me tell you, you set it and forget it until you have to actually restore from the cloud. And then that can be a nightmare of days trying to get all your data back, depending on how much you're storing in the cloud versus today having an external solid state drive, high speed. For example, on my computer, when I recently had to restore it, it took seven and a half minutes to restore 420 gigabytes of data. Doing that in the cloud might be 20 to 30 hours of time versus minutes. So something to consider. We'll talk more about that. So focus back, database server, domain name server. So we talked about DNS. So that's a server that's going to associate a name with an IP address so that we can get there. Again, if you're not 
either participating in class or you online folks, you're not watching those vi these those lectures, you definitely need to be doing that. That's where you're going to get all that information. File transfer protocol server, game servers for you gamers, a central location for online gaming. So you can imagine Microsoft, you know, has huge data centers with game servers as people are playing against each other all over the world in real time. Mail servers, network servers, print servers, web servers, etc. And we'll go into a little bit more detail as to servers. So virtualization, it's the practice of sharing or pooling computer resources such as servers and storage devices. I'm going to pause real quick. Uh, matter of fact, I'll do a separate video that demonstrates the idea of virtualization to you so that you understand it. But basically, let me sum it up for you. It's the idea of using one physical machine, whether it's a server or perhaps even your laptop, and virtualizing other operating systems or other servers. So, for example, I do some work for a company. I have a one physical server. It's very powerful, many processors, many much memory, and it's actually hosting five different servers that serve different functions within the organization. Now, the other problem with that is if that one server goes down, I lose five servers. So that server actually has a backup server that would take over. But if you think about it, if I had to have a backup server for each of those servers, that's 10 servers versus just two doing the job of 10. So wonderful things. More examples of servers. I really don't like these pictures. They're showing data centers versus just the server. This would be a server rack. Each one of these would be a server within the rack. A couple racks makes a data center. So when we talk about terminals, we tend to talk about what's called dumb computers or thin clients. And the idea behind a terminal is that it performs a very limited function. It doesn't necessarily process data. It's going to connect back to a server that stores the database. So you've seen these self-checkout, the terminal, you scan, scan, scan. That data is going into a database when you complete your transaction you're processing your credit card. So it's limited functionality. We're not going to surf the web on this, right? Uh, another example would be an ATM. So here's an ATM terminal and definitely a great example. Um, an ATM is not designed for surfing the web. It's not designed for checking your email. It is designed for banking. So it's going to have all the functions that, that a teller used to do for us at a bank. So terminal self-service, you know, financial kiosks, so pay bills, you know, add minutes to phone plans, etc. Photo kiosk, ticket kiosk, vending kiosk, um, and visitor kiosk. So visitor kiosk, you know, go to a national park. There's a computer embedded in there. You usually now touch screen. Where do I want to go? What is it I want to see while I'm here? Um, a lot of those, by the way, now will we'll even plan your day trip through the park, and you can download a smart app that that then will you know guide you with GPS th through the park. Uh, depending on how much time you have. So wonderful things going into play. Now, one terminal that you don't see here that I happen to like a lot is the idea of a vending kiosk such as Redbox. So I can go grab a quick movie, swipe my card. It's not designed to do anything. It's not going to you know, give, give me a Pepsi. It's not going to give me a candy bar or chips. It's going to give me a movie. So those are examples of terminals. Now, when we talk about a supercomputer, it is the fastest, you know, most powerful computer and the most expensive. I'll see if I can find some data on Google is creating their own unique supercomputers for specific purposes. You can almost call it like a sort of a super kiosk, you know, computers that are designed to do specific things. Okay, but when we talk about supercomputers, we're talking about, you know, trillions of instructions in a second. Um, it's normally many servers that are combined together, working together on a process. So that's what a supercomputer is. And then finally, I'll end this video with cloud computing. So cloud computing refers to the environment that provides resources and service services accessed via the Internet. OK, so via the World Wide Web. And examples of that, of course, are your Microsoft OneDrive, where you can store data in the cloud that's accessible anywhere, accessible from your phone, accessible from your Mac, your PC, your Unix device, whatever the case may be. 
not as much Unix as Linux, but you get the idea. Advantages of cloud computing. Another example might be QuickBooks, whereas we used to have to go and download the QuickBooks file, you know, go purchase QuickBooks, install it on our computer. Our QuickBooks file sat there. If I wanted to access it, I had to get to that computer somehow to get the data. Now, I just go create an account, a QuickBooks account up online. QuickBooks is storing my data. They're responsible for backing it up. They're responsible for updating the application and frankly, securing my data. So a lot of the responsibilities come off of you. However, the other side is if your data is in the cloud and you access it with a username and password, that means so could someone else. So more importantly than ever to have, and I will introduce one, a password vault where maybe you don't even know the password. It's a long, complex thing. It changes often and it secures your data, especially in the cloud. So, all right, that's enough for this one. Uh, we'll come back and talk more about the other portions of this lecture after this short commercial break. Take care.